Thank you very much for having me here. And, uh, you know, Chris, as, as he mentioned, I've spoken to the class uh, a few times on, on risk factor modeling. We've been using it uh, at PIMCO, obviously, for about 30 or so years, uh, both for investing and for risk management, um, uh, classic risk factors like duration, curve, spread, et cetera. So it's really good to see that uh, you know, there's such a great interest in it. I was right before this conference, I was uh, at the JP Morgan uh, Risk, risk uh, Premium Conference, and it was, uh, I think some of the people here probably were there as well. Uh, it's five or 600 people there as well. And uh, apparently there's another one going on in California right now. So great resurgence of interest in this topic, great resurgence of interest in uh, quantitative uh, finance. So that's all very good. Um, so the, the presentation is loaded. And let me just uh, tell you a little bit about uh, you know, what the goal was here. So as an investor who looks at economics uh, for motivation, so we are, I manage the quantitative portfolios team at PIMCO, but PIMCO, as you know, is a, uh, is a macro investor, is a top-down investor. Risk factor investing is extremely critical there because the risk factors themselves are representation of some sort of underlying economics. So what you'll see in my presentation today are two things. One is the empirical part, which goes back and looks at data from a simplified perspective. Uh, I call it a higher level of abstraction than the typical factor investing. And then the second part is actually uh, somewhat more proactive. As a portfolio manager, um, uh, I need to step, I have to step, I'm required to step a step beyond the you know, academic paper uh, reporting, et cetera, and say, you know, what am I going to do in an, this new environment with you know, negative yields and, and uh, the government in the, in the mix? So I'll talk about uh, risk factor investing or risk premium inf investing in the context of what's happening in the world uh, you know, with very low yields, et cetera. So let's, um, let's talk about the three things that... Uh, I'll address. The first one is uh, this idea of trend and carry uh, as a simplified version of uh, risk factor investing and risk premium investing. The second topic um, is about um, what I just mentioned, risk pre premium investing in an environment of negative yields. And the third one is a, a, a discussion of framework. Uh, it's not a new framework, but applying this new uh, approach, I guess, to an old framework to try to explain um, you know, how risk factor investing or risk premium investing could be incorporated in, in the new environment. So those are the three pieces. Uh, the, the first one is a published paper, and I think some of you might have seen it already. Um, it's uh, published uh, on our website, but it's going in the Journal of Portfolio Management, uh, and it's called uh, Trend and Carry in a Lot of Places. And as you can probably imagine uh, or realize, it's uh, um, uh, hopefully a modest um, enhancement or, uh, Monica, it's a parallel development to this beautiful paper by Cliff Asnes and his, his team called Value and Momentum Everywhere. So we, we're a little bit uh, modest, so we just in a lot of places. Uh, and, and we think in terms of market observables, and that's why I look at trend and carry uh, instead of value. So, uh, you know, the two things, the two papers come to relatively um, similar results, I would say, but um, the trend and carry uh, approach is probably more implementable in a very uh, direct cross-sectional sense of looking at, uh, looking at historical data. So let me get into this um, uh, paper first. And before I get into it uh, very deeply, let me just uh, uh, remind you of something that you all know uh, if you have taken a, uh, you know, advanced economics or advanced finance course. And I've just taken three equations. This is from John Cochran's book, um, uh, first chapter of, the, of that book that most people have seen. And this is just a modern way of trying to explain uh, pricing and risk premia. So I'm gonna have three equations in this paper, that's it. And those three are probably the most important equations in modern finance and very fundamental to what we're discussing today. That the first one, obviously, is that the price P of T is expectation of, um, uh, of, of payoff discounted by the stochastic discount factor M, right? So that's M um, uh, in the, inside the expectation uh, taken at time T. And uh, if you take this and you assume that um, you fo follow a log normal distribution with a simple CRA utility uh, with a, some uh, risk aversion function gamma, you get the you know, very easily deri derivable result for the risk-free rate, which is that the risk-free rate is equal to a uh, uh, subjective discount factor term delta plus term that comes from risk aversion times consumption, volatility or consumption change, that's delta log of C. Uh, and then the third term, which is a convexity term, which says that um, yeah, if volatility or consumption rises, then that has an impact on the, on the rate. So if you take a look at this equation, it essentially says that you know, if uh, 
risk aversion is high, rates will be high. If consumption growth is high, rates will be high. The uncertainty uh, also contributes, but in, in the other direction. Okay, that's the first equation as applied to interest rates. And this will have some bearing on what, when I talk about negative rates and negative discount factors, uh, or positive, very positive discount factors that come from negative interest rates. The second equation is probably even more important than the first one, and that's basically that the price today is the expectation of the cash flow discounted by that rate, um, but also has this important covariance term, right? Again, we all know this, that you prefer assets um, which have diversifying characteristics, and if you have an asset like equities, for example, that does badly with the rest of your portfolio, um, you know, when your portfolio is down and your wealth is down, your marginal uh, value of the dollar is higher, uh, you would require to have a high risk premium on it. So if you take that equation, expand it out, the third line says the expected return to a factor, the excess return to a factor is uh, that E of F, F is the factor return, minus the risk-free rate is essentially proportional to the covariance term. Okay, very, very classic finance. I haven't done anything new here. Uh, and it becomes important because uh, when you think of factors, uh, you have to really think about whether or not the factor actually is an economically sensible factor or not. So you, know, you can make a list of 300 factors. I think I missed Cam Harvey's talk, but I've read his paper. I've read most of the other papers on this topic, which are brilliant. And uh, I was at a presentation or a conference uh, last week uh, where Dick Roll presented his paper on, um, on factor identification or what is the protocol you should use for finding the right kind of risk factors. And of course, there was other follow-up uh, papers on that topic as well, and, and it's still an open question, you know, what is an economic, economically motivated factor? Um, so in the way I look at it is obviously it has to do something with whether or not um, it affects people's propensity to, to save or to, uh, to spend. So that's what an economic factor is, obviously, and, you know, the last equation says that you can probably um, think of the return, the excess return on these factors as coming from the covariance term. Now, we all know that this uh, consumption-based framework uh, that is very popular, uh, you know, the Chicago School doesn't really work too well when you think of uh, prices in a short term. It doesn't really tell you whether or not uh, something is valued appropriately or not. And that has to do with behavior, animal spirits, uh, you know, the variability of the underlying um, uh, uh, sentiment in the market, et cetera, et cetera. But we do know that over long periods of time, if you're harvesting risk premium, uh, by, through factor um, uh, positioning or factor modeling, which I'm going to get to in a second, you have to think in these terms because you're getting compensated for something. Okay, so um, so that's why I th why I say excess returns that come from factor investing are basically compensation for some sort of insurance. Right? Uh, I know Brian Kelly's written a very nice sequence of papers a few years ago on uh, on how the skew or the tails actually have been contrary indicators in many ways to indicate excess risk premium that you can have in the future. So again, it's a very uh, uh, big industry around this, the, this topic. Now, the last equation is an equation that I take from Andy Lowe's paper. And to me, these are the three fundamental building blocks of factor investing. Um, and again, in Chris's class, I've discussed the application of this in quite a bit of detail. But this equation says that uh, forget risk for a second and just look at the expected returns and just do this very simple decomposition in terms of the factors. You can break up the return to uh, an underlying factor or an asset in terms of three components. The first one is the alpha. It's very hard to get alpha. That is factor neutral or at least not uh, factor connected. The second one is uh, what we call um, timing uh, returns. So that's the correlation of the beta, which is your exposure to the factor, times the factor returns. So if you're long a factor and the factor goes up or have positive returns, you get positive returns in the portfolio. So this is the contribution to the portfolio returns. If you have a factor that goes south or has negative returns, you want to be shorted. You have a negative beta. Okay, the factor timing is the second component. And the third one, of course, is the most important component for risk premium harvesting, which will form the second part of my talk when I talk about risk premium in, a, in the world of negative yields, is you just want to be um, short insurance where the implied value of insurance that you're getting paid is higher than the actual or hedging value of the insurance, right? So if you go back to the previous equation I showed you, um, if you believe that excess return comes from being short insurance, then the third e equation says that the risk premium comes from being short disinsurance. Okay, so the framework, I'll give you a little preview when I talk about the framework. In my way of looking at things, which is a simplification, um, I think in this environment it's very important to think of assets and factors, not just as 
things that have had empirically good returns, but assets and factors uh, in terms of classification of are they insurance factors or investment factors? And I think this dichotomy becomes more and more important as you get uh, to these very strange uh, but important inflection points in the level of yields and, and, and credit spreads and so on. I'll talk about that in a second, so I don't want to give you all of the story just yet. But the point is that if you take these three equations, it says that by factor timing, by harvesting risk premium, by being short insurance, and then finding things that are orthogonal to it, uh, to the alpha, you can actually generate um, uh, excess returns. Now there is a big discussion, as you probably know, or if you don't know, you, I'll tell you, on, uh, on momentum. So momentum, obviously, uh, you know that does not very neatly fit into uh, this explanation as compensation for being short insurance or risk premium. And uh, there's a discussion going on right now, uh, which there's better people here in this room to talk about from academia than I am. But um, the discussion is, you know, is momentum even a risk factor? It's not a risk factor. It should be, what is it? It certainly gives you returns. So it's some sort of return factor. So the, again, my simple way of looking at things, momentum probably belongs in the middle part, which is more of a cyclical timing source of return. And risk factors belong in that last part, which is the risk premium part. Okay? And that's why um, I think uh, the combination of the two works so well. Okay? Uh, and that's what I'm going to get into now. So that's the, that's the body of the empirical paper that I talked about. Uh, oh, actually, before I get into it, let me just give you a, a, a little bit of a, a few examples so of, of this insurance concept. So you, can, you obviously know in credit, the insurance uh, premium that you're getting paid for is being short the default option. Uh, you historically got that. Today, the situation, as you'll see, is a little bit different. In equity, you're getting compensated for uh, growth type of premium duration, which is something I'm pretty uh, close to, you get paid for this rebalancing option. So you're selling an option uh, that you're not going to rebalance at some forward date to somebody else who's buying that option. So getting long duration is basically being short this uh, cash rebalancing option or getting the premium for it. FX carry, as we know, is related to macroeconomic variables like growth and inflation and so on, but it's also related um, based on some work that I did uh, that's in the Journal of Fixed Income is on, on the implied volatility. So the, the, the compensation you get in FX for FX carry, FX risk premium, is being short this insurance that comes from, uh, from being short optionality in, in FX. And that's why you know that the FX carry factor does very badly when volatility rises from very low levels to very high levels. Uh, and commodities is a classic Keynes uh, uh, compensation for uh, hedging pressures. So the, the producer sells its, their production forward, so if you're a buyer of the forward contract in a commodity, you roll up the curve, the commodity curve, you're getting compensated for being sh uh, short that option. Okay, so, uh, so, so, uh, so you can go on and on like that, and that fits in very nicely in this uh, uh, consumption or um, uh, covariance-based explanation that I, that I showed you a few minutes ago. So, so let me just go into the paper now. Uh, so what we did is, uh, in trying to simplify this way of looking at uh, factor modeling and risk premium, what we did is, uh, we went back and said, let's just do a simple counting exercise and uh, look at all the markets that we can get access to long-term data. In some cases, we had to make some assumptions. I'll get into the data assumptions, um, uh, for example, for 10-year futures and so on. But go back historically for the data and uh, find the futures data or cash data. We did mostly for futures and, and swaps. And um, try to figure out what is the best strategy in terms of uh, your factor exposures. So one way of doing this is to go and you know, build a whole bunch of empirical factors, do a statistical analysis, do like a you know, big back test fit and find the best statistical factors that fit. And um, you know, people do that, I've done that in the past, but it doesn't really give you much intuition. And if you believe uh, uh, Marcus's uh, talk and others' uh, talks, you have to be pretty careful that you don't bias yourself by over back testing. The second way is to just look at um, some commonsensical ideas and, um, and then apply them and see if they actually work. And if they worked, how well did it work? And if they didn't work, why they didn't work? So we came up with two very simple ideas that we think um, are like one step uh, more abstract or one step higher than traditional factor modeling and say, you know, the two things that we know that people have been saying for decades, uh, if not more, is be on the right side of the market. So don't fight the trend, okay? Even though it's kind of humbling to notice that just being um, with the masses and being on the right side of the trend can actually be you know, profitable. And second one is don't pay too much to invest, which in the language of uh, investing means don't take too many negative carry trades. Or if you 
cannot take negative carry trades, at least um, minimize the negative carry. Okay? And if you can, maximize the positive carry. So if you maximize the positive carry and are on the right side of the market, then you should hope to do well, okay? if you believe this commonsensical uh, approach to portfolio construction. So we went back and started testing this. So uh, the first example is 10-year futures contract. Uh, there's three graphs here. The first graph is just the time series of 10-year futures contract, uh, and then the carry on the futures contract on the right axis. Um, if you go to your iPad or wherever the link is, you can probably see the, the presentation a little bit better there. The top um, tape is essentially a classification of uh, four quadrants. So what we did is take the data and we classified into positive carry, positive trend, positive carry, negative trend, negative carry, positive trend, negative carry, negative trend, the four things you can do. And the, you can see there's quite a bit, bit of mixing. Okay, the light blue one is, in the case of the 10-year futures contract, the positive carry, positive trend, but you have other things there as well, okay? depending on the period. And it goes back to 1972 in this display, but we've actually gone back to 1950. Now, one question uh, that comes up, I'll just preempt it, is the futures contract didn't start trading until you know, the, the mid-70s, how do you get back to the 50s? And so what we did is we assumed that the, what's called the delivery option in the futures contract had relatively low value, um, and most of the carry that you got was from basically the yield curve carry, okay, from long rates versus the short rates. And that's an okay assumption. If you put the delivery option, things get a little bit better. But that's one of the ways we constructed the time series here. And what you see on the bottom table is the result. So what you see is uh, that your intuition was indeed correct. Positive carry, positive trend is the right thing to do. And the average returns, if you look at this table, were about 2.9% uh, over the whole period, annualized. But if you break it into these four categories, you find that the positive carry, positive trend was plus 5.2%. Negative carry, negative trend was negative 4.2%. Okay, and the other two were in the middle. So for rates, for sure, it looks like doing the sensible thing was the sensible thing, which was the profitable thing. You can also scale it by volatility, which is the right side of the table, and show the sharp ratios. Again, you find the same thing, 0.8. Actually, I shouldn't say sharp ratios. These are return over risk. Uh, it's 0.8 for the positive positive and negative 0.5 for the negative negative. And things in the middle are kind of small. So what this tells you in fixed income, you know, one of the things, if you know nothing else in fixed income, um, uh, one of the things that you're educated, if not through somebody telling you by the market, is that negative carry is very, very expensive. So in bonds, it's very hard to uh, take negative carry positions, especially if you're on the wrong side of the market. Okay, and the last year was, as a classic example, last year a lot of people tried to short bond markets, uh, which was negative carry, and they were against the trend, and obviously got killed. Uh, and this year, uh, you know, it's beginning to move a little bit the other way, but, but last year the best trade was obviously the positive carry, positive trend. So, you know, one would argue, you look at this and you say, okay, well, that's just the rate effect. We, we all know that rates have been falling since 1980-something, uh, you know, and you've just picked up the fact that rates have been falling and uh, in the bond markets being long a bond, a long duration bond, when rates are falling is obviously profitable, this positive carry and positive trend. So absolutely true. So we went and said, okay, let's do it for other asset classes as well. This second table basically uh, goes back and looks at all the other contracts that we could gather, uh, some from commodities, some from uh, rates, equities, et cetera, et cetera. And the first table basically shows you the underlying classification in terms of counts. How many times did you spend your time in each one of those quadrants? And you can see in commodities, there was a lot of time that you were in negative carry, negative trend. Fixed income was the other way, as, as we just uh, talked about. And then the, the other uh, combinations were mixed. Uh, you can convert this into a very simple indicator if you wanted to. This is not in the paper. It's something that I've been thinking about recently uh, as an indicator of when should you be long and, or short the market. So if you believe this hypothesis that you should be in positive carry, positive trend, then what you want to do is have some sort of signal that says, you know, when things are plus plus, you want to be long. When things are minus minus, you want to be short. And when things are in the middle, you just stay out of the market. Plus plus meaning positive carry, positive trend, et cetera, et cetera. So what I did was basically create a little binomial indicator which says if you are plus plus, positive carry, positive trend, it gets a plus one, negative carry, negative trend, get a minus one, and the mixed ones get a zero. And that's what I've done here, plotted uh, uh, the indicator across the four different asset classes or sectors by averaging across them. Very naive, no data mining, just plotted it. And you can see 
in commodities, um, you know, the data, uh, the commodity, commodities, I think, is uh, the first one. It's pretty volatile in rates. Clearly, uh, the last chart, um, it has been more in the positive, carry positive trend uh, part of the uh, spectrum. And then um, in equities, there was a long period of time where you were actually on the other side. It was better to be short equities. And FX is all over the place. You can combine them again. You can take another average and uh, create an indicator of an indicator. And, and this basically says, if you were to ask me one question, if my mother-in-law was to ask me, should, you be, should I be long or short the market? The, the market is corn and wheat and soybeans and hogs and bonds and equities and everything. What should I say? So this says, you know, on average, you should see uh, when the indicator is positive, be long the market. Of everything, and when things negative, be short the market, and that's been you know traditionally. If you backtest, it actually has been a good strategy. So this, I think, uh, is analogous uh, in my mind a little bit to the paper that uh, uh, the AQR people wrote on the value and momentum. Do you find a lot of correlation between uh, different sectors and, and so on and so forth? So let's go from just the counting now to looking at the actual returns. So again, what we did here is we went back and calculated the returns and then the sharp ratios or the, the returns over risk. And I won't belabor the whole table, but what you find is similar results, except for one or two exceptions. That, that's why you called it in a lot of places and not everywhere. So what you find is that most empirically, empirical uh, observations, you were better off being in the plus plus positive carry positive trend. And the worst thing to do was to be negative, ne negative carry negative trend. So as a risk premium harvesting strategy or a factor portfolio building strategy, what makes sense is to get the positive carry from your insurance short, generally speaking, embedded insurance short, and then um, be on the right side of the momentum, which may or may not be a risk factor, okay? So that's, uh, now, the, I still haven't um, convinced you probably that it's not a, just a figment of uh, uh, the, the fact that rates have been falling for the last um, two decades or so. So what we did was just limit the results to the rising rate period, okay, uh, 1960 to 1982. And again, results are very similar. As a matter of fact, in some cases, they get better. So what that tells you is that this strategy, this commonsensical strategy of um, being, you know, positive carry, positive trend actually works. And, and uh, the thing that you're told not to do, which is be on the opposite side of it for too long, actually is the right thing not to do. You shouldn't do it for too long if you want returns. No uh, uh, discussion of risk factor investing can be complete without a mention of risk parity. So I will do that here as well. Uh, I have no criticism of risk parity. As a matter of fact, I like it. Uh, I've written some papers on kind of decomposing it on why we think it works. Uh, there's other people who've done some really neat work on it as well. But the way I think about this in derivatives language is uh, any portfolio construction exercise where you take different factors and you put them together, either via correlations or volatilities or some sort of rules, um, basically harvest some underlying factor. So there's something that's going on which is making it work, okay? So if I now throw the lens of uh, trend and carry on it, um, and if you would bear with me for a second, uh, we're going to the world of options here. What risk parity appears to me is, is to be a leveraged short of real interest rates. If real interest rates fall, bonds go up, equities also go up, other assets also go up and it harvests volatility in a very efficient manner, okay? So what you can think of this is uh, the, the, the closest derivative security that comes to it that packages the rate short and the volatility short for the carry part is a, what's called a pair swap option or a put option on uh, swaps, an option to pay fixed on real rates. So if you were to take the time series of a pay fixed swap option doesn't matter what delta you used. Here we just use a 0 0.5, 0 0.4 delta pair swap option, which is going to make money when either real rates fall or when volatility falls. You should expect to see the same kind of behavior that you would see in naive risk parity. And I know people do fantastically sophisticated stuff with it, but this is a very naive mapping. And again, what you find is that this packaging of trend and carry optimally in the form of a pair swap option actually creates the same kind of payoff profile. Okay, so the red line and the blue line essentially track each other. Okay, so a poor man's risk parity, you just sell a bunch of pair swap options and real rates. Of course, you can't sell pair swap options and real rates because they don't exist, but you can sell pair swap options and nominal rates, okay, which would probably behave similarly because you're harvesting the volatility risk premium and you're harvesting the rate risk premium as well. 
Right, so, so go, go back to why. Uh, so I said empirically it seems like uh, being short, uh, it's being plus plus, being positive trend, positive carry has worked pretty well. And the question then becomes, okay, let's go beyond the back tests. Now why do you think intuitively this works? So I think, you know, think the W, right? So that's what it is. It's what it is what, what's going on here is, in, again, in option language, carry trades are basically short the central part of the distribution. You're selling in one form or another a straddle, whether you're doing FX carry or you're doing rate carry or something like that. And you can map it in a fancy model. For some cases, it's easy to map volatility to the carry. So in the central part of the distribution, you're selling this option straddle. And by doing a momentum trade or trend following or time series momentum type of trade, you're basically buying the tails back somehow unrealized. So if you have a portfolio construction payoff profile, which looks like this W, Okay, where you're harvesting premium from the middle, but keeping you protected from fat-tailed events by either momentum or tail hedging or something like that, you should expect over time, if you balance the two things properly, to actually have uh, positive expected returns. Any other combination, an inverted uh, V or a long V upside, regular V or inverted W shouldn't do as well intuitively because it's not immune to one of those two types of moves. Okay. Now this becomes very important in, the, in retrospect, if you go and check, create a W in most asset classes and run a back test, this actually works. Uh, it's not surprising because we came to this after we knew that trend and carry worked. And it goes back to the criticism uh, uh, discussed earlier today. But the question becomes is in a forward looking environment when yields are very low and the center part of the distribution is getting squished down by central banks, is it still expected to work as well? Okay, because you're not going to get as much carry anymore, but uh, you still have the other part of the trade. So let's go into that in a second, and, uh, and I'll wrap up. So let's go into um, negative yields. So here's uh, just two quotes side by side that tell you how far we've come. Uh, of course, when I was doing finance, negative yields were, uh, when I was learning finance, negative yields were uh, considered an impossibility. As a matter of fact, we were told Vasicek, uh model was wrong because yields could never go negative. And uh, of course, Vasicek is back uh, with the fury now. Yields are negative. But here's the two philosophical uh, views of it. Uh, the first one uh, is from Walter Block from 1978, which is a basic principle of Austrian economics, is that the original rate of interest uh, can never be negative. The reason for this arise is not because capital is productive, nor out of man's psychology. Uh, rather, it is embedded in the very concept of human action. Okay. Uh, strong words. Uh, and the second one says, it may be time to go negative. If lowering interest rates stimulates the economy and policy rates are already very low or even zero, then why not keep cutting rates and have negative interest rates? The idea of negative rates that is lending 100 and getting back 95 may seem absurd. But remember this, early mathematicians thought the idea of negative number was absurd too. Right? That's from uh, Greg Mankiews. So again, very different philosophical approaches. And what is an investor supposed to do? Uh, when you've got uh, both of these being reflected in um, pricing and market perception and so on, more of the second today, obviously, because rates are negative in a pretty large part of the world. Uh, here's a chart, obviously, of central bank purchases. Again, it's just maybe a couple of um, uh, months old, but you can see there's no net supply. Okay, net supply of uh, bonds of high quality. And uh, it's gone south because central banks have pretty much bought up everything, right? So. So when you come to factor investing and risk premium investing, even though I'm a proponent and I like it, uh, the question is, you know, is there, are there factors worthy of investing? Uh, is the pricing in the factors worthy of investing today? And if so, which factors? Where do you want to be selling insurance? Uh, are you actually selling insurance and getting returns or are you actually buying insurance? So we'll see that in a second and something that's actually fairly striking. But, but here you can see there's no supply of fixed income assets uh, and hence, uh, it's very hard to say that your factor exposure to fixed income assets like duration factor, which is key, has been key for a very long period of time, has any potential of actually returning very much uh, ex ante. Uh, you can see here the percentage of the bond market at negative yields, negative nominal yields, uh, which are never supposed to happen. Uh, of course, they're over 60% now. Uh, the duration weighted yield, I think, uh, across global mar bond markets is under 2%, maybe even lower than that. Um, so there isn't much du duration uh, 
a yield uh, compensation for, for buying duration, is, especially in these markets where it's actually negative. So here's the question then. So, so if you go back to factor investing and say the reason you do factor investing, one of the reasons other than the factor timing part, which you can do, is to harvest the risk premium part. Well, is there duration risk premium at all when yields are negative or not? So this is a very hard question. Uh, decomposing the term premium is not a trivial question. There's, this is from the Kim Wright model that the Fed uses. You can build any affine model you want and you can come up with your own estimates. Generally, you'll find that most term structures around the world have negative term premium right now, uh, at least in the developed market. Okay, a very low net, uh, term premium. While you're considering that you, things might actually be even worse, because now we have a, uh, I'll give you a hand-waving argument. Again, not mine, goes back to Fisher Black, which says that things could actually be even worse if you're thinking of a factor to invest in, let's say, today, and that factor is the steepness of the yield curve. The duration basically makes it money, its money from the steepness of the yield curve. Okay, you keep selling insurance, hopefully, by extending duration, and you keep getting compensated by the rolled out and carry and so on. That's the lower. Well, let's think about this for a little bit carefully, right? So go back to the, the black uh, way of looking things, which says the observed short rate is nothing but the shadow, some sort of shadow rate that you don't see, plus a, an option on the shadow rate. Okay, so that's that equation, the, the first equation. So if the shadow rate is positive, then the observed rate equals the shadow rate because the max term goes away. Okay, that's, the, that's, the, that's the floor. But if the shadow rate is negative, then you can see that the observed rate is zero. So you can, so let's assume for a second that yields were not negative, the yields were at zero, which, which is the, the extreme that this model allows. You can see that when the shadow rate is very, very negative, you have the short-term observed rate zero. Now, you go one step uh, further and say, what is a yield that you're trying to harvest through factor investing or risk premium investing? Well, a yield is basically a compounding of, um, of the short rate. That's what all a yield is. You're just buying short rates uh, at all future points in time. So if you compound, this equation is a compounding of expectations plus compounding of the risk premium on top of expectations plus, in this way of looking at it, compounding of the shadow rate call. Okay, so when rates are very, very low, you're getting three different contributions. Now we know that the last part, which is the contribution from the option, grows with time. All options values grow with time. So yields, if you look at the yield curve, the compensation that you're getting could be either the risk premium compensation for selling an option, or it could be the compensation for being short the shadow rate option, which is very volatile and hard to predict because it depends on QE or quantitative easing, right? So if you're building a factor model and you're not environment aware, you don't really know where you're at today in terms of level of yields and the participation of central bankers and so on, you could be completely misleading yourself in harvesting that factor or so-called so factor premium. Okay, so that's, that's a, one example of how things have to be rethought, in my view, uh, in this whole area. And it's become obviously very popular. Factor investing is very popular today, but um, I think we ought to step back and make sure that we understand what the driving uh, features are. Now here's an even more perverse example, right? So I mentioned that you, the reason you get payment for um, credit factor investing, spread duration and credit, is because you're shorting a default option. That's your classic covariance-based argument. Well, here's a bond from Nestle. Um, it's uh, 2016, this is one example. Um, three quarters of 2016 uh, of a company, a corporate, uh, very, very well-rated well company, but it's actually a negative yields, not negative spreads, negative yields. So what that's telling you is that if you buy this bond today, not only are you lending money to the corporation who has the right to default on you, but you're actually paying them for that right to default. Right. So, do you call this risk premium? Uh, do I, I probably don't want to call it risk premium. I would probably call it something like a short-term insurance premium that I'm paying to Nestle because I don't believe uh, I want to give money to the Swiss government. Right? Because, so, so things get very, very complicated, obviously. Now, this is not the only example. This is not an anomaly. Right? If you go to um, Denmark, for example, right now, there's a lot of talk of mortgages trading at uh, negative yield. Mortgages themselves, you can go to the bank technically. I'm not sure if this is true or not. Maybe this is just a rumor, but you can technically go to the bank and you can take out a mortgage and they'll pay you money as well. And 
Uh, but it is indeed true that there's about 35 outstanding issues, mortgage issues, uh, asset-backed securities in uh, Denmark right now where the yields are actually negative or just recently went negative, where you are obligated to pay the issuer a coupon every month. And if you don't pay them the coupon every month, what do you think they're going to do? They're probably not going to give you their principal back in full at the very end. So this becomes very interesting because no longer are these assets uh, uh, assets that are amenable to traditional factor modeling or even traditional risk premium modeling. They become more of a kind of a legal, uh, legal, legal ticket. So I gave you two examples, but I could probably draw many examples from other asset classes as well. So we're in a very special environment today in my view where uh, traditional factor modeling uh, may or may not actually be very, very useful um, uh, when applied without being environment aware. So let me just conclude with this, uh, uh, the third part of my presentation is just one slide. So what have I done trying to um, improve my own approach to factor investing and factor modeling? Okay, the first step I do is think of the assets underlying the factors as either insurance assets or investment assets. Okay, if I have a bond that's trading negative 20 basis points, let's say, a German Bund in short maturity, uh, I can think of, I have to first think of whether or not that asset is an investment asset. So now let me make the, um, the problem even more complicated because if I'm a relative value investor, I could say I can buy this bond at negative 20 basis points, but I still make money from the carry because short-term yields are at negative 70. So if I wait long enough, this is indeed an investment asset because I'm going to make 50 basis points of carry. On the other hand, if you are a risk premium or a factor investor, that doesn't make any sense because at negative 20 basis points, when you buy this bond, if you hold it to maturity, you're guaranteed a loss because all the income you're gonna get from it has already been discounted today and been paid to you, and you're still willing to pay a higher premium for it. Right? So it's very important then to classify why you're buying it, and traditional relative value type of analysis doesn't really make much sense going forward unless you, you think about you know, what the characteristic of the asset is. Um, in conclusion, what I think is you could probably still get on for a few more months, maybe for a few more years, uh, and factor investing uh, uh, with, with a factor investing approach for most asset classes. But in the case of fixed income asset classes or very credit uh, heavy asset classes, uh, I think uh, that framework for the timing is uh, probably not very useful or at least should be, uh, should be tested. Um, and it is, you know, where does it lead us? At the end of the day, it says it after, you can't forecast the risk premium part, you can't really figure out the timing part, you still have to go back and look for alpha. So with that, I'm going to stop my uh, uh, presentation, give it to Kent to discuss it. So I, I was given two papers to discuss. The first one is the carry trade paper, and um, I'll get, do a, I don't have access to their underlying data, so I'm going to do a high-level de uh, description of each one. And uh, I think uh, uh, Veneer and the uh, co-authors, my bottom line on top, is that they do an excellent job of empirical decomposition. It's really one of the best empirical papers, I think, on the carry trade out there, especially with how, how they reconstruct some of the historic uh, uh, data. Uh, <clears throat> my margin orders are to connect the, what they've done with some of my recent work on measuring risk. And my bottom line, which I think is actually very consistent with his work, is that the carry trade, even during good days, is, is, um, is a good example of why standard risk metrics are, are not always appropriate, in particular the sharp ratio or look, simply looking at volatility. Um, and I, I think that the carry trade, even during kind of good times, um, still has to prove itself with more robust risk measures. And then the second paper on low negative interest rates, um, uh, you know, the, the big issue there, of course, is that we don't think nominal rates can go negative in theory. You could always hold cash. We'll talk about a little bit of why they could. All right, so um, trading occurs at a higher frequency. Uh, let me, let me uh, give you some uh, five minutes of background, and I think this is kind of important at setting the stage. When we talk about performance of, a, of an investment, um, the trading frequency is obviously much higher than the, the frequency at which the uh, uh, investment's actually being measured, where you're calculating a sharp ratio or something else. And so what that does is that even if, uh, suppose that the underlying risk 
is normally distributed. So for example, the risk at the uh, trading time interval is normally the, uh, distributed. The fact that you're actually measuring like your sharp ratio or your volatility, something like that, at a lower frequency allow, means that you have a dynamic trading uh, strategy and that underlying uh, ultimate risk distribution is not necessarily normally distributed anymore. And we'll show a carry trade is an example of this. All right, so let me start with a very simple example here. Suppose that you, you start with 50% of your portfolio in a risky asset. It's normally distributed um, uh, by construction. 50% of your, your uh, uh, portfolio in a risk-free asset that's paying 1% per year. And you're, you're doing 50, uh, 50 uh, asset allocation um, each week. So you're rebalancing kind of once, once a week um, uh, for a, a year. But your rebalancing rule is really simple. You're always going to just take your returns, whatever they are and just do 50% in stocks, 50% in bonds. Your annual distribution, not your weekly, your weekly distribution when we know is normally distributed. Here's what your annual distribution will look like. It's fairly normal distributed as well. It's technically not normal because of interaction terms, but it's close to being kind of normally distributed. And here's your sharp ratio um, that accounts for the first two moments. It's basically 0.62 using weekly S&P uh, uh, 1500 data and as an annual sharp ratio. And what I'm showing you there in the slides are the higher moments. Uh, uh, three, four, five, and, and, and so on. This doesn't mean anything right now. Uh, just hold that as a, as a benchmark. Now, as a hypothetical, let's take uh, a, a veneer talked about Andy Lowe's uh, a paper. In fact, uh, let's talk about Andy Lowe's uh, tongue-in-cheek capital decimation partners. In particular, how can I get volatility up um, suppose I start selling put options, and in particular, I sell 10% out of the money put options, and I sell enough options to basically produce an, a, a, an additional income of 3% per year. So what happens with this type of strategy is that your look at your sharp ratio associated with it, it goes from 0.62 to 0.96, a huge jump in the sharp ratio. How did you get that? Look at the uh, uh, higher moments, is that the even moments are getting bigger and the odd moments are getting smaller. You get smaller skewness, larger ketosis, and so forth. Um, and we know that rational investors actually always want larger uh, uh, odd moments. We want positive skewness. And we don't like um, uh, uh, larger even moments. And so the reason why this uh, uh, strategy works is that it, in some sense it's gaming our volatility metric by pushing all the action into the higher, uh, higher moments. And so, of course, Andy Lowe hopes you don't invest in these types of strategies. Let me give you a simpler strategy because put options sound complicated. Suppose you just did the following. You just did our, our simple baseline, 50-50 portfolio, but now we're gonna let you rebalance uh, each week along, along the way. You originally invest $1, and you follow the following rebalancing rule, which is just simply a function R, and D minus one, your original investment was $1, so whenever D differs from one, you're, you're gonna be allowed to rebalance. Now again, the draws are IID normal, so, there's, uh, so for a rational constant relative risk aversion investor, there would actually be no rational reason for the, him to rebalance. It's not like from one week to the next, his human capital is sufficiently depreciated. There's no reason why he would want to rebalance. But we want a large, yeah, a large sharp ratio, a large expected return relative to volatility. If you do, I won't tell you how we get to this, but this is actually the optimal quartic rule for rebalancing throughout the, uh, throughout the year. In particular, uh, by construction, if your original fund value, if your fund value stays at $1, it doesn't change throughout the year, you're, you're, you're at your 50-50 um, stock bond investment. As your fund value goes down, so you're losing money, what do you do with your stock investment? You increase the proportion of your investment in stock as, in fact, the, uh, the fund value goes up by more, uh, uh, that is a greater than a dollar, you decrease your stock investments. And this rule right here, by the way, again, is not a rational rule. It is simply meant to try to get the highest sharp ratio. Um, and in fact, it, you, this rule is actually shockingly familiar. It's buy low, sell high, it's contrarian investing, something dollar cost averaging. Um, in fact, it's, a, it's actually a crude form of deep out of the money uh, uh, put selling. And in fact, uh, it, it actually generates a distribution that looks now like the red one. Remember the original was the blue one, which was almost normal distribution on the annual basis. Now with this value trading, 
it's simple, it seems like a pretty innocuous rule, you actually get this red distribution, which is definitely very non-normal um, in distribution. The sharp ratio also goes up, not as far as Andy Lowe's capital decimation partners, uh, but it's still going, but cause, simply because we have much weaker trading, only once per week, it's simple uh, a stock bond allocation, we're not using options and so forth. Again, notice what we've done here, is that the sharp ratio, the volatility has gone down, the expected return's gone up, the sharp ratio has gone up, but we've pushed all the action into the higher moments. They've all worked in the wrong direction. All the evens are getting uh, bigger, all the odds are, are getting smaller. Carry trades historically have worked in much uh, of the same way. In particular, here's a paper in the Journal of Finance a couple years ago. What it's basically showing is that it's a various different carry trades uh, strategies. We won't have time to talk uh, all ab about them, um, and you, that's the reference there you can look at. But notice as you go from carry trade um, investment one to five, um, it, it's sorted by sharp ratio. Uh, the better trades, in fact, are higher sharp ratio. But notice what's happening to the skewness and kurtosis in each case. The skewness is always going smaller. The kurtosis is always going bigger. In other words, the, all the actions being pushed into the higher moments. Um, and, and by the way, the carry trade can actually, uh, uh, Veneer has a, has a very nice paper in 2007 that actually shows the connection between carry trades and option uh, uh, trading. My bottom line is that the, uh, we need, if we're evaluating carry trades, just a much more robust um, uh, a measurement. And that's what I've been working on. Basically, um, the, it's it really real, economists really think expected utility, not volatility, is really the paradigm um, and still the most compelling comprehensive risk measure. A recent literature on rare events has shown that expected utility is actually really good at generating lots of different price uh, uh, moments in the literature. And what Sharp showed is that this ratio is actually, that the Sharp ratio is actually a, a valid measure of expected utility. It's increasing expected utility when the underlying distribution is normal. What my recent work is, uh, is showing is, is how to extend that to all uh, underlying distributions. So, so my bottom line is I'd love to look at your data, run it through our kind of measure, and see uh, how robust it is. Interest rates. A second paper. So nominal rates can go uh, uh, negative. That used to not be the uh, belief. And the belief was that if you could carry, if you could hold cash, you could always just hold cash. Therefore, uh, nominal rates could never go negative. It seems like that's not happening. But the rule theory says nominal rates can, um, can, uh, can actually go negative if there's no safe store of value on a nominal basis. Your money can get robbed, burnt, and so forth. But much more importantly for developed economies, uh, the, the money has to be transactionally friendly. And in particular, it's, uh, it has to be actually available for doing transactions, um, if for large transactions. And that's probably what's happening in some other countries. I don't, uh, it's maybe less likely in the United States. Here I'm on my soapbox. I just don't get this market, to be <laughs> honest with you. And here's what my biggest confusion is. If you look at the estimates of government debt, and these are conservative CBO baseline, not their alternative fiscal scenario, which we actually know is much more uh, a negative and it's actually more realistic. As far as the eye can see, publicly held debt is a, just shooting off, you know, unbounded, even on the most conservative of uh, assumptions. And so how can interest rates be so low. Um, you know, it, it, whenever you've seen a scenario like this, um, historically, where well, Latin America plus we're hungry and things like that, it usually leads to great monetization of that debt, massive inflation, and so forth. So what is kind of going on? And this is where some humility is uh, required in the economics profession. And I think I got my last slide a, a, a little story that convinced me, or, uh, or depressed me, is, is probably the, the, uh, more likely. And, and that is, everybody says, well, there's a demand for safety. Everybody's buying debt because there's a demand for safety. That previous chart doesn't show debt being particularly that safe to me. But so, you know, maybe that's true, but maybe not. As an economist, I've been trying to reconcile the long-term picture, why isn't this being incorporated into 30-year rates and things like that? So a few years before Lehman goes bust, about four or five years, they asked Ken Rogoff and myself to come in and talk to their largest 75 income uh, investors. And Lehman, a big fixed income shop, and Ken talks about the short run, I talk about these depressing long run. 
and they both have uh, you know, a little panel that, that, that corresponds to his talk and my talk and so forth. And my panel basically said, no, I'm wrong because we believe in rational expectations. And so far I'm thinking, okay, good, because I can't explain why you know, yields are that low. If this is really that horrible of a picture, yields should be much higher, people should anticipate inflation and so forth. So, so far, so good. And they say, okay, um, they explain what they meant by rational expectations. They basically said, you know, when I see everybody else jumping, that's when I jump. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, suddenly my dorky pre-tenure life say, you know, explain to them that's not rational expectations, that's actually hurting just the opposite, that's what leads to big panics. Ken Rogoff, being much more esteemed and much more tenured than me, basically tells them how crazy they are. And basically that was a very, very much a wake-up call to me, and that is why do fixed income markets just not project forward uh, enough, and we see this in Latin America, Asia, and throughout the rest of the world. It's not like the news suddenly came in, hey, the government's balance sheets don't make any sense. And, and rather, that news has been known all along. It's all of a sudden, the markets just suddenly reacted. And, and that's what I think is, uh, you know, what's so uh, uh, depressing about uh, uh, this, this, this whole, uh, the current negative yield that we're in, is that eventually, you know, will uh, capital start to panic? Um, will things just snap like we've seen in other markets? And that, that's the reason why um, it actually, I think for the carry trade, this large foreign exchange risk is which what I think drives the higher moments, is what presents a lot of risk. Um, Veneer, uh, would you like to respond uh, to uh, the discussion, and then we'll open it for a few questions? Uh, I'm, I think uh, everything Ken said makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, to continue that very last point, I'm interested to hear both of your thoughts. And how does also inflation and printing money comes into the picture of the negative yield? And if that all ties to factory investing, that's also great. But even just continue that argument with Latin America and all these other places and the sudden sort of spikes uh, and the ability for U.S. to print money and the inflation where it is today. Does it still not make sense? Yeah, I think it comes back. I'll take it first, and Kent, you can jump in as well. But um, and so there's two things going on that are, I think, mutually uh, opposing here. So if you think of low rates as stimulative of inflation, that's the advertised reason for having low rates. You want inflation to rise. But it's not going up. The only way I interpret this is that there's maybe in the minds of either the rational or the irrational investors that future inflation um, will be combined with some sort of default. If you think of uh, a default on, you know, so you can have, you can take money from people two different ways. You can either not pay them back default or you can inflate it away. So depending on what the balance in people's minds is, if you believe that at some point this you know, 15 trillion or so of uh, printing press money has to get withdrawn that results in higher defaults in the non-sovereign uh, market. It doesn't matter what inflation is, you want to protect that cash. I think that push and pull probably you know, is one economic way to explain this thing, but uh, at the end of the day, it's very hard to disentangle for me because the buyers of the debt are essentially the right hand and the left hand, right? I mean, the, the central bank's uh, buying what the treasury is issuing in every country almost. So. I think the informational content that we traditionally had from markets, the factors are created from markets, then you invest in the markets and they create new factors. Very nice way of using information and investing simultaneously. I think that link's broken right now because you can invest in the factor but the information it's providing is probably very fuzzy or inaccurate information. And yeah, I mean, historically, what you've seen is that when you had um, runaway inflation, it was always driven by a fiscal policy problem. And do I think the U.S. will default on its debt? It's a political question, but my guess is no. We'll crank up the printing press. And, you know, uh, will it be, you know, a rush of capital from the United States to the rest of the world? Right now, you know, the United States is 25% of the world's capital stock. It's large enough that it's not like the capital will just easily get up and go the way it did from other countries like Latin America and so forth. Um, but 
it, without solving this fiscal policy problem, uh, Veneer is exactly right. Either we have to not pay you back, or we're going to pay you back with, um, with weaker dollars. And for me, I, I just don't understand nominal, nominal rates in particular. Uh, it, uh, to me, in the United States, they actually seem way too low. Um, and, um, and by the way, the third approach that some countries like Argentina try to do, they try to pre-commit themselves by issuing real bonds, what we call tips in the United States. And that's a way of trying to you know, handcuff yourself as the, as, as the government, saying we won't inflate our way out. Um, but then, who decides the inflation rate? Argentina <laughs> decides inflation rate. And so what do you do? You just lie. <laughs> and you say the inflation rate is way below than what it actually is. And that's how they dealt with the problem. And so it's, um, but which is another way of saying they basically defaulted or they're printing their way out even with real bonds. What's your physical intuition for black shadow rate? What's the physical intuition for black shadow rate? I don't think, uh, I mean, his paper is beautiful. It's three pages or four pages long, uh, and it actually has very deep insights inside of it. But my, my sense from reading it a few times is that it's a mechanism. Uh, so for him, it was just a mechanism to explain um, you know, what rates, um, like explain monetary policy or forward monetary policy value of, uh, of money without actually uh, putting a bound on uh, nominal rates. So you know, he's essentially saying that it doesn't matter what nominal rates are. If you can take, uh, if you can print money and take the shadow rate down, which is what's driving the economy, driving mortgages and so on, uh, you don't really care what the nominal rate is. Uh, it's just kind of a, an option or it's, a, it's, a, it's something that is a, um, is just a remnant of the fact that the shadow rate is the thing that's moving the economy. And, and we, we know that, right, that two or three years ago, maybe a uh, few dealers came up with an estimate of the Taylor rule, uh, which is basically yeah, translates from inflation gap and GDP gap into nominal rates. And they said, according to the Taylor rule today, with given what the gaps are in the two economic variables, the short rate should be negative 8% or negative 6%. And obviously, that's the shadow rate that the Fed is targeting, in a sense. So one of the lessons of classical portfolio theory is that co-association prices assets. And Veneer, you had the, uh, the, the expansion from John's book. And um, um, can't you mention it to some degree? But you know, it's not just covariance. It's co-skewness. And those papers classically have existed for, ma for many, many years. In the carry trade, although you might think about carry trades having uh, deep left tails, isn't the key the correlation of the tails? And that, you know, this, this sort of, sort of pre-crisis notion of commonality in the tails um, it, it represents a big, big lesson in some sense, although we've known about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. To bring it back to connect your two uh, discussions today, isn't really what we're talking about is the, is the correlation in the tails? Yeah. A higher order co-association in the carry trades. If they're not uh, correlated, then don't they look to most investors to be idiosyncratic? Mm. Yeah. That Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No, I think I think so. All higher moments, you would think. And you know, I think Kent pointed exactly right. I think uh, you know you prefer uh, the odd moments to be high, and and don't prefer the classic utility theory. But uh, it is the tails that investors care about, and the co skewness of the trail tails. And the expansion only holds when you have you know like a first order expansion, a Taylor expansion. But but that, that's exactly right. It's uh, and what happens, for example, in two thousand eight, is all carry trades simultaneously got hit not because the volatility went up, it's because the fat tail nature of all of them simultaneously got uh, exposed. And that's when you know, CTAs and trend following did really well. So, so if you take our data and actually expand it and you know, look at the CalMAR ratios and the and higher moments, you actually find the same sort of results over a long enough holding horizon. Because in combination, the two things actually diversify each other out. So the co-skewness correlation or co-skewness on the tails actually gets compensated by this massive move in the markets, which is the trend, which actually bails you out. Yeah. I mean, I only had one point, and that, and that is even beyond skewness, we still care a lot about even the higher moments and have a, examples in some of my work where even skewness and kurtosis don't seem like they explode, but the higher moments really explode. And there, there's a, we actually care, care about that as well. But then the question becomes one of measurement. 
right? Yeah. I mean, what we know is that uh, trying try to estimate kertosis is nearly impossible, you know, yeah. bearing to bring to bear as well, you know, time variation in moments. Yeah. It's really hard to estimate those. Yeah, my response to that is, do you have a structural model or, or just reduced form kind of data? I agree with you in terms of data. You have prior certainty, ultimately, is what drives it. Sure, I mean, so if you actually have, if what drives the higher moments is your trading rules themselves, then you can actually highly, you can actually estimate the higher moments very precisely. In other words, suppose that your underlying risk that you're trading is normally distributed. Now, you might have a confidence interval around, the, around those different parameters, but dy the dynamic trading itself is what generates the higher non-normal moments for the skewness, kurtosis, and so forth. So if you actually know what your trading strategy is, given your initial assumptions about the, the uh, underlying dis distribution that you're trading, you can actually calculate what your higher moments are very precisely. Now, w one could argue, but we actually don't know what the, you know, even the first two moments maybe are. Um, and so we put some confidence intervals around that. I won't go, go into this, but it's true that the higher moments, the confidence intervals of those, given your trading rules, they get really big. Yeah. But the, the actual um, uh, uh, ranking mechanism that, for example, we came up with is actually um, dampening those by n factorial. And so it, the confidence intervals of the overall measure, inclusive of the high, higher moments, is not exploding. In fact, it's actually very similar to what you would get if you're doing a, like a sharp ratio. And it must get worse because returns unconditionally don't follow Pareto Libre rules, right? You can, they're not additive. Uh, in yeah, the I mean, so. uh, okay, good. Yeah. Not, can in a world in which cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin became mm -hmm. ubiquitous, uh, would the Austrians be vindicated? <laughs> no, negative rate, you mean, yeah, so, yeah, so, you know, I don't know much about Bitcoin, but if you're at the question, the broader question is, uh, if there is another way to store money, uh, like, you know, maybe even say uh, free Brinks, um, or, you know, you get uh, protection for your money, uh, would, would this, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's some lower bound. I think maybe at negative 50 basis points yield or negative 20, the frictions of actually, um, uh, going out and buying a big safe or, you know, or armed guards or something like that, or Bitcoin, which is another way of doing it, it's probably worth it. Um, so I think, yes, I think the markets will get to that point. But that's exactly the fundamental, I could have maybe summarized my whole talk, talk with just that, is that at what point is it risk premium and at what point does it become a cost that you're willing to pay? And today it look, appears, and I think we both agree on that, is that a lot of markets look like they're not factor investing in the traditional sense is basically factor investing for protection. Mm. I mean, but you're absolutely right. I mean, if for nominal rates uh, to be able to go negative, they, you have to have some risky store or, or a value. And to the extent that, you know, Bitcoin's pretty risky <laughs> for a while, but to the extent that cryptocurrency in general can be kind of a non-risky store of value and it's transactionally friendly, then in theory, you should never see nominal rates go negative. Thank you.